Uh, how many here have ever played baseball? All right. Even pick up baseball in the street anywhere. Well, then you know basically that baseball is a duel. It's a duel between a pitcher and a batter. Now, how would you like to have on your team a pitcher who throws a strike every time that no one can hit? How many would like that on your team? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, now, how would you like to have on your team batters that could never, ever hit a pitch? Oh, I didn't see a single hand go up. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, baseball a little bit today, but I really want to talk about the Bible. And I, I got the title here, Three Strikes and You're Out. I'm going to talk about three strikes and you're out. And uh, you see, before baseball ever existed, there was this expression in the Bible, for three and even for four, da-da, okay? And then Amos is going to pick this up right after you get past verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 of Amos. He's picking up and he's going to say, for three sins and for four, and I will judge you. Our expression is three strikes and you're out. In fact, I'm convinced if Amos were living today in our culture, he would have used that expression, three strikes and you're out, instead of using for three sins and even for four, and I will judge you, okay? Okay. And so I want to just, every time we see that expression for three sins and for four, I want you to think three strikes and you're out. Because that's what we're dealing with here. In a ball game, we all know, and when you go to a ball game, you want to know who's on the mound, right? Who's pitching? Because you want to know what kind of gun he's got on that arm, you know? What, what is he going to be firing? You all know who's going to be up to bat. And if you don't, you're looking at the number, you're trying to figure out who is this batter, you want to find the name, you might even want to look up the stats and all of that, but, but in baseball, you have a pitcher on the mound, you have a batter up to the plate, and then you want to think about what kind of pitch is he going to choose to throw? Is it going to be a curveball, fastball, change of pace ball? Is it going to be up high, down low? Is it a slider, a knuckleball, a spitball? I don't know what a spitball is. Do you know what a spitball is? But as kids, we would spit on the ball, and it was a spitball. But there's all kinds of, what kind of pitch? Now, the announcer, if you're watching on TV or radio, they tell you exactly, oh, what kind of pitch it was, you know? And so you know what the guy swung at, neither miss or hit, and, and, and that kind of thing. But then there's the thing, why do they pick that? You ever watch the pitcher? The pitcher gets a signal from the catcher, and he's telling him, basically, I'm expecting the ball to be where, and he tells him with a signal what he wants, and then the pitcher, no, no, the pitcher decides what pitch he's pitching. He shakes that off, no, 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 that's not the one. He gives him another sign, no, 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 I know the pitch I want. Yeah, that's it. And then what's he do? He winds up, he hurls that. Why does he want that one? He wants that one because he knows the weakness of the bad. He said, I've given him two fastballs, and now I'm going to throw the change of pace because he's seen my, the speed I've got. And so he's really going to really, this next time he's expecting that fastball. And so he, he throws that change of pace, so the guy will swing way before it gets there, and he misses. There's this duel going on. Duel going on. What is the call? Well, the umpire is the one who's calling. He calls strikes, you get three of them, and you are out. And they get very demonstrative. You ever notice that? Some of them get very demonstrative, and if you get four balls, you get a walk, you get a free base. Wow. We were at the baseball game yesterday. Not major league, but was major to my grandson. <laughs> and he was playing ball, and he did a great job, and, but, but he even took a hit. And I think it stung a little bit, but he got a free base. He stole second base, third base, and home. <laughs> yeah. Now, how often do you see that in a game? But, you know, I really don't want to talk about baseball as much as I want to talk about the game of life. And you know how it goes. You know who's on the mound? I'm going to tell you who's on the mound. God Almighty is on the mound. In Amos, he's going to have this expression repeatedly as the Lord is on the mound. He says, this is what the Lord says. So it identifies who's the pitcher here. And so I know who the pitcher is on the mound, but who's up at the plate? He will then say, this is what the Lord says, for three sins and even for four, 
of, and then he names a name of who is up to bat. In this idiom, three strikes and you're out. The next thing that I notice in the text, it repeats it over and over. Every time a batter comes up. What kind of pitch he is throwing. Now, he says, I will not turn back my wrath. You know, some, some pitchers have the fastball. God Almighty has the wrath ball. Think about that for a moment. Our God is a consuming fire. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God has a wrath ball. A judgment day is coming. And so when I'm talking about the game of life, I'm talking about something much more important than even a World Series. Why that kind of pitch? Why is God throwing that wrath pitch? We're going to find in the text that he's going to give a reason every time why that wrath ball comes across the plate. And finally, we're going to see what the call is by the umpire. He says, I will send fire and I will destroy. Wow. All right, let's go to the first batter. First batter is Damascus. We find that in the text. We find it in chapter 1. He says, who's on the mound? This is what the Lord says. We know who's up the plate. For three sins and for four, Damascus. <clears throat> he names them. Damascus is up the plate. <clears throat> the pitch, I will not turn back my wrath. The Lord is using not the fast pitch, but the wrath pitch. And he throws that blazing across the plate. Why? Why that pitch? He says, because she... Damascus, a nation that was northeast of Israel, she threshed Gilead with sled, sledges of iron teeth. Now, the sledge was a platform uh, that a guy would stand on, it would be hooked up to an oxen, and it would be dragged over all the, the wheat or the, the grain that had been brought in, and it would break the husk off so you get to the kernel. And it's saying, this one had iron teeth. But he's saying they weren't doing it to grain. They were actually doing it to my people, uh, which would have been Manasseh or Gad that lived in the region called Gilead. And he said they were doing it. And what he's saying is, the reason why I'm throwing this wrath pitch is because of their extreme cruelty to my people. Did you ever notice people can be really cruel? They can be really cruel especially kids. Kids can say really mean and hurtful things, but so do adults. Gossip, sharing something in such a way that makes a person look bad, even if it's a prayer request, is nothing more than gossip, and it can be downright cruel. cruel. You know what I notice in this passage? God is throwing a wrath ball for cruelty. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. So what happens? The call is a wrath ball goes by. Well, they swing. They can't hit it. They can't drive that wrath away. Mm -mm, I will send fire upon the house of Hazael. Hazael was one of the kings. And I will consume the fortress of Ben-Hadad. Hadad was a false god. Ben means the son of. Apparently, Hazael named his son after the false god. He's the son of Hadad. And I will break down the gates of Damascus, and I will destroy the king and those in the valley of Avon, and, and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Aden, and uh, the people of Aram, and they will go into exile to curse, says the Lord. God is throwing the wrath ball, third strike, you're out, you're doomed, you're judged. Woo! Did I ever tell you my God is an awesome God? My God is a consuming fire. Batter number two steps up to the plate. This time it's Gaza. Gaza. This is what the Lord says. The Lord is still on the mound. This is who's at the plate for the three sins of Gaza and even for four. Who, what's the pitch? He said, I will not turn back my wrath. He said, hey, that, that wrath ball works so well, I'm going to do it again. So he throws that wrath ball. Why? Because, he says... Gaza took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. He sold them out. Sold out God's people. We've got to be careful how we deal with Christians. 
just as they needed to be careful how they dealt with the people of God. We are supposed to give our lives for our brothers. They will know that we are the disciples of Christ by our love for one another. And when I carry bitterness, hatred, anger, when I really want somebody who is a Christian to fall because they perhaps are not of the same political persuasion as I am. That is so wrong. They sold out the entire cap, uh, people to eat them. To eat them. I will send fire upon the walls of Gaza and that will consume her. That is the call. Let's go to uh, what he goes on, he says, and uh, I will destroy the king of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon, and I will turn my hand against Ek Ekron until the, the last Philistine is dead. He, he's saying he's wiping out all of the Philistines because they sold out God's people. They didn't just capture them, they sold them away into slavery. Third batter steps up to the plate. This time it's, uh, it's Tyre. Then the Lord is still on the mound. This is what the Lord says. Who's at the plate? For three sins and for four. Tyre's at the plate. The pitch, he doesn't change the pitch. The wrath pitch worked in the other two players. Now he's going to work for the third one too. He hurls the pitch. Why? Because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom disregarding the treaty of brotherhood. You see, Edom is Esau. Israel is Jacob. Jacob and Esau were brothers. And so there is a family feud going on. Does it still go on today? In the Middle East? Family feud? Israel and Arab? Between Jacob and Esau? Between Israel and Edom? And what were they doing at Tyre? They were supporting the enemies, uh, their enemies, and causing a family feud between Edom and Israel. It's a terrible thing for you to meddle in a family in such a way that it turns brother against brother, sister against brother, brother against sister, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, father against son, son against... You know what I'm saying here. You're meddling in other people's business that causes strife, brings the wrath of Almighty God. I will send fire upon the walls of Tyre, and that will consume her fortress. That is the call of the Lord. You are out. You are out. Out. Fourth batter steps up. This time it is Edom. Well, we just saw that Tyre sold the people to Edom. And so it says, this is what the Lord says. He's on the mound. And that the plate is Edom. We find that the pitch is the same, the same wrath pitch. And it says, because he has pursued his brother with the sword, stifling all compassion. Obviously, the meddling of Tyre with Edom has caused something so that there's a, a lack of compassion on, on, on somebody that's in the family. Now, does that ever happen in the church? One person says to one person something, and that person then gets angry at this other person because what this person said about that person. You know what I'm talking about? You are stifling compassion. We are to be a loving community where we build up one another. In fact, the Bible says we are preferring one another in love, not tearing one another down, not being uncompassionate. Merciless, or pitiless, but of all compassion. Because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion, because his anger raged continually and his fury aflamed unchecked, the Lord threw the wrath fall. And that, all I can say is this is just plain meanness. Now, I was a mean older brother. And my little brother, everybody always called him poor old David. Because I, I, for some reason, I was mean to my little brother. Maybe because he got more attention, he was the baby, and I had lost my babyhood. 
And I'd pound my little brother, and they'd say, I'm so mean. But I didn't let anybody else pound my brother. Somebody else pound my brother. I'd pound the daylights out of them because he was my brother, and that was my right to pound my brother. Nobody else pound my brother. <laughs> but we all have a mean streak. It's in there somewhere. But when we manifest that mean streak, what does God say? I hurl the wrath ball at the mean streak. The mean streak. I will send fire on Taman that will consume the fortresses of Bozrah. That's the call. You're out of here. Judgment. It's the judgment call. Three strikes, you're out. You are out. Fifth batter steps up to the plate is Ammon. Ammon is the fifth batter. This is what the Lord says because he's on the mound. Who's at the plate for three sins of Ammon and for four? Listen, this is the pitch. I will not turn back my wrath. He's got a pitch that's working. You remember what I asked you at the beginning? How would you like to have a pitcher on your team that he strikes out every single batter in three strikes? <laughs> Folks, I'm talking about the Lord. I'm talking about the Lord. Why does he throw this pitch? Because he ripped open pregnant women. Folks, we're talking about abortion here. He ripped open pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his border. In order to extend their borders, this is what he was doing. He was destroying the next generation of warriors. So they would invade the land, find the pregnant women, cut them open, pull out their babies. It's called genocide. And this still goes on today. Earlier in the 20th century... Uh, not the 21st. It was called eugenics. Margaret Sanger started it, Planned Parenthood. And the idea was, because she wanted to curtail the births of black children, was to abort black babies. Genocide. 19, what, 74, Roe versus Wade gave the right to do that. Do you know the black population is only 13% of the American population? Had there been no abortion of black children, they would be approximately 30% of our population. Genocide today in America. This passage tells me God throws wrath at the abortionist. America has brought itself into a position of deserving the very wrath ball of God. I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah I will consume her fortresses amid war cries and on the day of battle, amid the violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile. God says, three strikes, you're out. That's what he says. That's what he says. Six batter steps up to the blade. This time it's Moab. Moab. And this is what the Lord says. He, he's on the mound. This is who's at the plate, Moab. Moab's at the plate. Here's the pitch. Oh, you're getting the picture? <laughs> that, that wrath ball's working so well, folks. Why? Because he burned as if to lime the bones of Edom's kings. This is an odd thing to write, isn't it? Here's what's going on. It's not enough that the enemy's king is dead. They go and they dig him up and they get his bones and they set him on fire to burn the bones so they desecrate the body. You see, it's not enough that they conquered them. they got to desecrate him. What this is is extreme hatred. Can I tell you what it's like in America today? It was not enough that they voted the president, Trump, out of office. They had to impeach him afterward so that they would make him look really, really bad. He couldn't impeach him out of office. He was already out of office. Come on. This is just extreme meanness, hatred. Whoa. I'm just trying to say this stuff still goes on today. And it makes us deserving of the wrath ball of God. Here's his call. I will send fire upon Moab. And I will consume the fortress of Kiriot. Moab will go down in great tumult among war cries and the blast of trumpet, and I will destroy her rulers and kill her, all of her officials with him. Whoa. We come to the seventh batter. 
Now it's going to lead a little closer to home because Judah is the southern kingdom of the divided kingdom of Israel. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Now he's going to zero in on, before it's been all the pagan nations. Now it's the conflict between Israel and Judah. In-house, in the family. And watch what it says. Who's on the mount? The Lord is on the mount. Who's at the plate? For three sins of Judah and even for four. Three strikes and you'll be out. And this is what he says. I will, will not turn back my wrath. Oh my goodness. The wrath of the almighty God who is a consuming fire. Why? To Judah. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord. <laughs> I don't believe the Bible. Come on. How can you believe Genesis 1 and God created? We know it was a big bang. Are you kidding me? Were you there to see it? God was there. He told us how he did it. They reject the law of the Lord. They're rejecting all the commands, really the, the Ten Commandments and the 613 listed in the Torah. They're, they've thrown those aside and said, well, we're going to do it in our own cultural way. <clears throat> it's a whole new world. It's like one of my sons said, Dad, you're just old-fashioned. And I think about when I was young, I told somebody that, well, that was older than me that they were old-fashioned. <laughs> They have not kept, but they rejected the Lord, the law of the Lord. They've rejected the Bible as the authority for their life practice. It's what I'm doing. When I say, well, you know, the Bible is outdated. Uh, I'm living in new times. Uh, that was for a, a world that then was and not for now. I am deserving the wrath of God. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. They rejected, not kept his, his, his decrees but they have been led astray by false gods. The gods of their ancestors followed Baal. Baal worshipers. Baal worshipers. The fertility god. The sex god. I don't even have to tell you how that's, that's like America today. We were wa watching a, a, on television and it seems like even commercials have gone woke. Even, even the commercial, every program. It, it, it wasn't enough that they introduced gay people, now it's transgender people, now it's whatever comes out of the pipe. And it's cramming everything down our throats. They reject the word of God as a standard for your faith and practice. And this is the false God bail of the world in our culture today. And we as Christians, tribe of Judah, the Lord throws the wrath ball. Whoa! Are you kidding me? Why? Because judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. We need to have our act together. Whoa. They rejected God's word, and because they rejected God's word, it says this, I will send fire upon Judah that will consume their fortresses of Jerusalem. God did. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came, and he destroyed Jerusalem carried away all the vessels and artifacts of the, the, the temple, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, and then, and then for the next 70 years, it lay fallow. Because God had promised in 70 years it would be restored, and so 70 years later, it was restored. But the wrath of God was brought upon a people who reject the word. Who reject the word. I want you to notice something in the text here. The first one was to Damascus. That's kind of the region where Damascus was. Gaza. So we go from one end to the other end, opposite sides. Tyre. Then he goes to Edom. You notice something going on here? Oh. Then he goes to Ammon. And from there he goes to Moab. And then he goes to Judah. And there, guess what's left? Man. You know, at this point, I'm going to tell you something. At this point, all the Israelites are cheering on Amos. Think about it. He's just said, God struck out every one of their enemies, even Judah in the south. <laughs> Yay, Amos, go for it, guy. We love you. You're a good man because you're, you're, you're telling us what we want to hear. And uh, there's Israel. Now watch what happens. Oh, eighth batter, <sighs> Israel. <laughs> oh, Israel steps up to the plate. Whoa. 
This is what the Lord says. The Lord still on the mound. Who's at the plate? Oh, for three sins of Israel, even for four. The pitch, same pitch. Right now, I can see the crowd saying, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It was okay for you to be pitching or throwing your pitch, telling the pitch of the Lord to those, those, all of our enemies, but this is a little close for home. I know how this works. On a Sunday I'm preaching, and a person after would say, boy, I sure wish so-and-so was here because they sure could have used that. You know what I'm saying? But they're not here because it wasn't for them today, it was for you. Whoa. Hey, as long as Amos is preaching against the enemies and not against them, he's okay. But now it's a little close for comfort. God's throwing a wrath pitch at you, Israel. He's throwing one at us too. Why? He says, here's why. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of stuff. It's not a bad enough that Tyre is selling to Edomites and, uh, and the Baskets is selling to Edomites and, and all of this slavery is going on. But Israel itself was doing what the world was doing. I think, think sometimes the God, we, we bring the wrath of God on ourselves because we're living like the world, not like a Christian. Whoa. Whoa. Second thing he says, they trample on the heads of the poor. And upon the dust of the ground, they deny justice to the oppressed. It is not justice equal for all. They're tipping the balance in their own favor. And I think at times we're all guilty of that. We tell a story, but we make ourselves look good in the story. When I hear the other person, the other spouse in a marriage situation... They tip the scale for their story. I can never do them alone. i got to do them together so that they cross-check each other. Isn't that right? They're trampling. They're trampling. There's injustice. It's, it's wrong what is going on. Listen. A father, the third thing he says, a father and a son use the same girl and so profane my name. Whoa. Commentators are a little divided on what this means to use the, the same girl. I think what it's talking about is because of the next line in here, because the next line is going to say that it has to do with their Baal worship and it's a fertility cult. They're both going into the same girl. And they profane the name of the Lord. You know what's going on here? God is saying, when you don't act like a Christian, you profane my name. When I blatantly reject the word of God and I act differently than I should as a Christian, I am profaning the name of the Lord. Whoa. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledges in the house of their God. They drink wine taken in fines. Listen. Eighth batter has been swinging and they profane the holiness of God that God set you apart from the world to be different from everyone else. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, people should be able to say of you, boy, I know that you're a Christian. If we're not living it in such an evil culture that it should be such a stark contrast between us and our evil culture that people say, that's a Christian. If they can't say that, then we must be just like them. Making common the holy things. That's what it is. Holiness profaned is when you take something that is really, really good and treat it like it is not. You profane it. You profane it. To the eighth batter, he gives a little commentary next. Basically, it's like this. After all I have done for you. Think about that for a moment. All of these charges that bring on the fast wrath pitch of God. And you know that some of them are like hitting home when you kind of make the application from there. And then he says, and after all I have done for you. And what did he do for them? He said, I destroyed the Amorites, the Amorites before them. Though he was tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks, I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. He said, I cut them down. They stood in your way when you came from from." captivity. He said, let, let me back up and tell you the story. 
I brought you up out of Egypt. So he took him down to Sinai and gave him the commandments, set him up and constituted him as a nation, said, I'm taking you to a promised land. He said, and I led you for 40 years in the wilderness. Even though you rebelled against me, I still led you every day with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I led you for 40 years, and I brought you up to the land, and then we took control. We, we fought the Amorites. We fought the Ammonites. We, and I gave them into your land so that you could then enter the promised land, and I gave you that land. Have you forgotten what I've done for you? I saved you from the Egyptian slavery, and I brought you to the promised land. Have you forgotten what I've done for you? I hear him say, Dennis, you've forgotten what I've done for you? Remember when you were eight years old and you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Forgot what I've done for you? Do you remember the years of journey, even though you rebelled against me and, uh, as a teenager and... and Remember how I brought you back to myself and you almost died and you realized when your two friends had died and you didn't, I spared your life. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember how I brought you along? He said, number three here. After all I've done for you, I also raised the prophets, spokespeople. God gave the prophet the message. And Amos is saying this and he's a prophet. He's been given the message from God and he's preaching it to the people. And he says, I... I also raised the prophets from among your sons and, and Nazarites from among your young men. The Nazarites were like, mm, what can I compare them to? Monks. They promised that they would never cut their hair and they would never drink wine at all. Zero, zilch. If they did, they violated their Nazarite vow. What was this? This was to show the whole nation that you can commit yourself to God fully, be fully devoted to him, like these Nazarites who made a vow, and they never cut their hair, and they never drank wine. They could do that for the glory of God. And if they can do it, you can do it in other areas of your life. He said, listen, I gave you examples. Is this not true? People of Israel, declares the Lord. Didn't I? Haven't I given examples of how it's supposed to be among you? But this is what you did. You forced down the throats of the Nazarites' wine. You made the Nazarites drink wine, and you commanded the prophets not to speak. Later in the book, they're going to do that to Amos. <laughs> the, the, the priest is going to say, Amos, get out of town. We don't like what you're preaching. We don't like what you're teaching. Whoa! Whoa! Now, then this is what he says. He says, now, I will crush you. Now, they didn't have car crushers like they got today, but the image is pretty much the same. I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. You get that cart fully loaded, and then you run over your leg, it will crush your leg. You'll have a broken leg. You'll walk with a limp the rest of your life. Whew. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength, and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand its ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warrior will flee naked on that day. You, you will not escape. Whoa. I want to move to the ninth banner. The ninth banner is you. You see, this book wasn't written for Amos. It wasn't written for Israel or Judah while they were alive. It was written for those who came after them. That's us. God is still the pitcher on the mound today. Listen. You are up to the plate. God is throwing his wrath ball. Whoa. You will swing and miss every single time. You want to know why? Because we're all sinners. Do you know what the word sin means? means to miss. <laughs> it means when the rat ball comes and you're going to stand there and you're going to take that bat and you're going to whack it, you're going to miss every single time because when he throws the pitch, he strikes every single time. Whew, we're in big doo-doo. I can't win in this game. Are you kidding me? No. Nope. You can win if you have a pinch hitter. You know what a pinch hitter is? He's a substitute. He steps in, takes your place. 
I have a pinch hitter. His name is Jesus. Jesus stepped in, not with a bat, but he stepped in with a cross. And when the wrath of God was hurled, he took the cross and he nailed that fast wrath ball and he knocked it as far as the east is from the west. That's what the Bible says. That's how far away he said, my. How far is that? Well, the east and the west never meet. He has sent it away infinitely far away that it will never return to me again. I will never experience the wrath of God. Amen? I'm glad Jesus is on my team. He steps up to the plate. The ball comes, whacks it. And the New Testament says, I have an advocate with the Father. You know what that is? It's a defense attorney. He's my substitute. He represents me. He steps up to the place. Every time Satan comes accusing the brothers, accusing me, saying, aha, hey, Lord, look at Dennis. He's sinned again. My advocate steps up. He takes that bat, which is the cross, and he nails that accusation. It's gone. Gone, gone, gone. Jesus is my pinch hitter. You know what the word pinch hitter means? My savior. The day he saved me, he stepped in and he nailed the wrath never to touch me at all. There's no hellfire, no damnation coming my way. Every one of those, those received wrath from God. Fire, 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 fire. But Jesus has nailed it, taken it away. You know, if he's that good as a pinch hitter, just think what he would do as a coach. What, what do you think if you had Jesus as your coach? All right, here's what I'm thinking. Here's my point. You don't have to strike out every time. You don't. You don't have to strike out every time. You can hit a home run. You say, well, how can I do that? How, how do I do that? And the way you do that is you let Jesus pinch hit for you as your Savior, and then you make him your coach. And he will coach you to do just the opposite of everything that brought the wrath of God on those nations. Like Damascus. They threshed the people of God. They were so cruel. No, no. He'll help you to be a helper, to be kind, considerate. Listen, if you follow Jesus as your coach, you do what the coach tells you to do, you will be true to the people of God and you won't sell them out. You won't. He'll coach you how to do that. He will coach you. He will help you to keep your word, not break your promises or break treaties, of, uh, 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 treaties with your bro of the brotherhood. He, he, he will help you keep your word because he's your coach. He's your coach. Instead of being uncompassionate, merciless, and mean, he will teach you to have compassion. He will touch your heart. Have what is Bible, King James says, bowels of mercy. You'll, just, you'll have this feeling inside, compulsion, that I just have to help people. He'll make you pro-life. You may have to leave your political party, but he will make you pro-life. Because he's created us in the image of God, and even in the womb, it is an image bearer of God, to take that life, to take that life, it's an open assault on God. So you will change your position. And you will say, I want to be pro-life. If Jesus is your coach. If Jesus is your coach. You will be meek, not arrogant, proud. You will be meek. You will be humble. Jesus as your coach will help you. Every time you're pitched something from the adversary, anyway, who's ever on the mound? Jesus will help you hit that so that you are in the game of life. He'll help you keep the word. He'll help you keep his word. He has sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is called the helper. He will help us in our journey. And he will help us bless the Lord, not curse, blaspheme, profane the name of the Lord. I want Jesus on my team. I want him as my coach. Do you, do you know that there's a, a, a baseball rule book? Are you aware of that? There's a baseball rule book? And there's also a spiritual life rule book. It's called the Bible. <laughs> and, and in the Bible, Jesus gives us the game plan. 
and he tells us how to play the game, whoa, it's all there for us. It's all there for us. As we pray, I want us to pray and then go play. <laughs> play ball the way the Lord wants us to play ball. Okay? Father in heaven, this has been an interesting passage in your word. It's so relevant to the world in which we lived, and we, we just kind of skimmed over all this. But Lord, we, we see that you are on the mound. And you're hurling the pitches. We have nothing to fear with Jesus on our team. He nailed, as our pitch hitter, that raft ball, never to strike us again. He's our coach. He's my Lord. And what the Lord says, I will do. And when I do it, we see the blessing of God. We actually win the game. The game of life. Lord, if there's someone here who's never made Jesus their Savior, ask him to step in and take their wrath and give them eternal life. I pray they do that right now. Just say, Lord, save me. Be my pinch hitter. There's some here who have accepted Christ, but Lord, they, they know that they've got one foot in the world, one foot at the plate. With Jesus, sometimes coach, sometimes the world is coach. And they need, Lord, to just fully follow Coach Jesus as Lord of their life. Help them, Lord. May they right now say, Lord, be my Lord, because you are my Savior. Coach Jesus, guide us through this day, I pray. In your name, amen.